Amen. Thank you so much, worship band. Can we just say, just give an applause of thanks for them. We also want to give a special thanks for Layla. Uh, it's her first time up joining us this morning. She said she loves attention, and so. Well, for our New Testament reading this morning, uh, we are going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, ver- chapter 10, and I'll be reading verses 6 through 13. This is the word of our Lord. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be adulterers as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of our Lord. Uh, for our scripture text, uh, for, excuse me, for our sermon text uh, this morning, we are going to con- be continuing our sermon series through the book of Samuel. And so I ask you now to turn to 1 Samuel. We're going to be reading chapter 29. This is God's word. Now the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek, and the Israelites were encamped by the spring that is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines were passing on by hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men were passing on in the rear with Achish. The commander of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commander of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years? And since he deserted to me, I found found no fault in him to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Send the man back, that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us in battle, lest, the battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is this not David, of whom they sang to one another in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands. And David his ten thousands? Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been honest, and to me it seems right that you should march out and, and march out and in with me in the campaign, for I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the Lords do not approve of you. So go back now and go peaceably that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. And David said to Achish, But what have I done? What have you found in your servant from the day I entered your service until now, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? And Achish answered David and said, I know that you are blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us in battle. Now then, rise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who came with you, and start early in the morning and depart as soon as you have light. So David set out with his men early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. But the Philistines went up to Jezreel. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Most wonderful Heavenly Father, we ask that by your Holy Spirit you would loosen my mouth to preach your word, that you would open our ears, open our hearts to receive your word, for it is life to us. Lord, help us to be attentive to your word. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Well, stories, they like to 
put uh, their characters in impossible situations. I'm sure many of us have, we've either uh, read or we've watched one particular uh, situation and where uh, the main character, the hero, they, they have to make a, a particular decision. Uh, the situation that I'm talking about, it, it typically goes something like this. Uh, on one side, uh, it's typically a train or a bus, and it's normally filled with, uh, with children or with uh, puppies or something like that, some, some sort of innocent uh, character. Uh, on one side, in that bus or that train, it's about to somehow go over a cliff. And then on the other side, you have the hero's true love, and that uh, and that true love, they're also in danger. And that main character, the hero of the story, they typically have to make some sort of choice. They're in a lose-lose situation, but they have to compromise somewhere. Do they fail to serve the greater good and, and, and go and save their love? Or do they fail in their loyalty and in their love to uh, whatever the romantic interest is and they save uh, the, the bus or the train. Well, this type of situation is used over and over again in stories. Uh, I couldn't choose one, right? I think that that scene has probably been in every single Marvel movie uh, that's ever existed. It's been in uh, Toy Story. It's, it's been in a whole gamut of others. I'm, sh- I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Why is it that we like putting our main characters in these sort of impossible problems, these impossible situations? Well, I think it's because life is filled with situations like these, where situations, they, they genuinely seem impossible. You and I, we, we feel compelled to, to make some sort of choice. We feel compelled to compromise somewhere on our loyalties and our commitments. And we feel, we feel that pressure, and, and we like putting that situation in stories or in movies because I think it gives us hope that, that somehow there is a way through, somehow there is a way in which that tension can be uh, made through where we don't have to make choices like that. Well, what I want each of us to hear from our story this morning is that if you ever feel like you are put in an impossible situation, if you are ever put in a place where you genuinely feel like you have to compromise somewhere, I want to encourage you to hold on because God preserves the blamelessness of his people. That's what our story is really about. It's about how God will preserve you and he will preserve your integrity and your blamelessness in life no matter what a situation might look like. Now, the story is actually a part of a, of a large uh, a larger story that actually began all the way back in chapter 27. Uh, these scenes are all interrelated, and so last week, if you remember, uh, I'm going to bring this up be- now because we're going to be referencing to it. Uh, in chapter 28, this is when Saul, uh, he went to go visit the medium, and that's really, I think, where this story uh, that we're reading today, that's really where this story begins because uh, that story, that scene of Saul visiting the medium, that's really meant to be a contrast uh, for this story that we're reading here, but this first section uh, that we are going to uh, that we're going to be looking at here, we're, I want us to call it a lose lose situation, because that is the situation David, our main character, he is finding himself in. Uh, now, if you remember, like I said, it, this this story started way back in chapter twenty seven. Chapter twenty seven, David he he left. Israel, he left the land of Israel and he went to go live with the Philistines and he made his way to King Achish. And there he's able to live peaceably for about 16 months. He's able to avoid any sort of problem with Saul. Saul had stopped hunting him. He's able to avoid any sort of conflict uh, with Israel and with the Philistines. And he doesn't have to betray, he doesn't have to make any sort of decision. He's just sort of in this limbo uh, for a season. But then right at the beginning of chapter 28, if you have your Bible open, I want you to look at chapter 28, and I want you to look at verse 1, because then a problem arises there for David. It says, in those days the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Achish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard 
for life. Okay, so David, he's, he's now forced into this problem. He, he not only has to go to war with Achish against Israel, but he's also promoted to this, this, this officer-like position. He is now supposed to be Achish's bodyguard. He's Achish's right-hand man. Okay, so that starts the beginning of chapter 28, but then chapter 28, it, it just leaves us on this cliff, cliffhanger. It, it introduces a problem, but then immediately it, we jump to Saul. Okay, the camera moves back towards Saul, uh, and Saul, we, as we know, we looked at last week, he goes and he visits the medium, and so for a while, we're just sort of left waiting. What is David going to do? There's this problem that's been thrust upon him. David has been able to be in this place where he's able to, to have his cake and, and eat it too, but we don't know what he's going to do, and then we go to Saul. But here in chapter 29, the camera pans back to David, and that tension the story begins to rise, because in verse 1, it reminds us, oh yeah, remember the problem that was mentioned earlier. Now the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek, and the Israelites were encamped by the spring that is in Jezreel. And the question uh, for any reader or for any listener at, at this point is, what is David going to do? Where is David going to compromise? He, he, he hasn't had to make any sort of choice at this point. He's been able to live with the Philistines in peace. He's been able to avoid danger from Israel. But now he has to make a decision. He can't continue to have it both ways. Is he going to fight and kill his own people Israel? Is he going to fight and kill his brothers uh, in, in battle? Or is he going to fight against the Philistines? Now, I, I think we know enough about David at this point in this story to know that, that David would never turn his sword against his own people. He was so reticent, that even though opportunity presented itself for him to strike down Saul, he never once wanted to, to lay a hand against Saul. He felt guilty and bad for even cutting off Saul's robe, and so I don't think it's out of the question uh, for us to to know that David would not be necessarily entering into battle ready to fight against Israel. But at the same time, what does that mean? That would then mean that he's going to go into battle and do exactly what the Philistines worried that he would do. He would then turn against them, and, and that would likely cost him his life. That would likely cost him the lives of his own men. And so you see, David is in this lose-lose situation. Uh, but before we go on, I want us to just reflect for a moment on how you and I, we might respond in similar straits. If we were put in this situation, would you and I do the right thing? Or would we compromise? Well, as I mentioned, the text has already given us uh, an alternative predicament uh, to, to what David's situation is in. If you remember in chapter 28, Saul was also in a lose-lose situation. He has the Philistines coming to him. They're on his doorstep. They're about to go into battle. Saul is crying out to God, and God is nowhere to be found. And so what does he do? In, in temptation, in trial, in this seemingly lose-lose situation, Saul goes and he visits a medium. And that picture in chapter 28, I, I, I think, is very much a picture of how you and I can respond to what feels like impossible situations. It's this, this picture that shows us that you and I, we can, in fact, compromise. You and I can, in fact, give in and not do what is right. We can give in to temptation. We can give in to self-gratification. We can give in to our own self-serving interests. And I know oftentimes you and I, we, we like to think uh, that we are the heroes of our own story, that we would, of course, do the right thing, that we would, of course, be able uh, to endure, that, of course, we would, no matter uh, what might come our way, we would never compromise. We would always stay true to our calling. But what, what chapter 28 points out to us is that you and I are capable 
of failing. You and I are just like Saul, flesh and blood, just like Saul, anointed with the Spirit, just like Saul. And that is a reality that each of us have to reckon with, that you and I are actually, in fact, capable of failing and compromising. Uh, there's this, uh, this the, the famous scene in the Lord of the Rings. I haven't done a Lord of the Rings uh, example in a while, so bear with me. Uh, in Lord of the Rings, there's the famous scene uh, where, where Frodo and Sam, they finally have made it uh, to, to, to Mordor. They're finally in the caverns of Mount Doom. Uh, and, and Sam, or excuse me, Frodo, he has the ring in his hand. Sam, his friend, he's spurring him on, drop the ring into the fire, cast the ring into the fire, destroy the ring, then all of the problems that have, have happened and, and all throughout the story will finally be over. But right there at the end, to everyone's shock and dismay, Frodo, who has been the hero of the story for, for, for three different books or three different movies, whatever your preferable medium is, he's been the hero of the story. There at the very end, he closes his fist, and Frodo fails he closes his fist and he tight, grasps the ring tightly and he says, no, the ring is mine. Now Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, I think he did such a wonderful job in that book of showing us that even the hero can fail. The hero, when pressed in a lose-lose situation, the hero can, in fact, fall. And that's a reality that ought to do one thing for us. That's a reality that I think Tolkien does a beautiful job of showing us. That's a, that's a reality that chapter 28 uh, with Saul and the medium shows us. That's a reality that, that, that really ought to just do one thing for each of us. And that is humble us. You can, in fact, fall. You can, in fact, fail. No matter how much you might think you're the hero of your own story, no matter how much you might think that you are able to endure and not compromise. Chapter 28 says that that is not true. We need to recognize in Saul that we are not as strong as we think we are. We're not as good as we think we are. We're not as resilient as we think we are. We more often than not will compromise and do the wrong thing rather than stay true to what you've actually been called to do, which is to stay true to your God in obedience. And that's why Scripture's constant message to you and I is really this. Be humble and know this. You are not the hero of your own story. You are not the hero of your life. But instead, Scripture tells us continually to be humble And to trust that God will provide a hero and that trust that God will, in fact, do what is right by you. This leads us to the second half of our story. Uh, So in in that first half, if we we can call it a lose-lose situation, uh, this second half, I want us to call it a win-win salvation. Uh, So so, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, he really is a wonderful storyteller. This this is not going to be a sermon all about Lord of the Rings, I promise. This is my my last reference. So if you remember, Frodo, he fails in throwing the ring into the fire. He closes his hand, and he gives in to the ring's power. Okay, but then what what happens? Well, for those of you who have read it or or watched it, you know that, that all of a sudden, unexpectedly, Gollum... Right, the, this this the CD character Gollum, he jumps on Frodo, and they wrestle and they fight over the ring. Gollum wants the ring just as much as Frodo wants the ring, and they fight over this object. Gollum bites Frodo's finger, but then and he he finally gets the ring for himself, but then he falls into the fire, and Gollum and the ring they're destroyed all at once. Good wins out in the end because evil destroyed itself. And Tolkien, he's such a wonderful storyteller because he brings you to this place 
where you truly feel like evil has won. He brings you to this place where you truly feel uh, like there is no more hope. The happy ending is, is now impossible to achieve. You believe that the story will be a tragedy. You become so convinced of that. And only then, once you've lost all hope, only then does salvation come. Tolkien, he, he actually had a word for this. Uh, it's, a, it's a word that he invented. He invented a whole language, uh, and so he, he obviously he invented a word. That's uh, not surprising to us, but he called that, that, that moment, he calls it a eucatastrophe. And so it's, it's become my favorite word uh, over, over the years since I learned it, eucatastrophe. And, and he says this is a eucatastrophe. A eucatastrophe is the opposite of a catastrophe. It is a massive turn in fortune from an ins- a seemingly unconquerable situation to an unforeseen victory, usually brought by grace rather than heroic effort. And you might think, okay, well, what in the world does this at all have to do with our story here in 1 Samuel? What in the world does this have to do with David? Well, that you catastrophe is exactly what we see here in this chapter. So just like in in chapter 28 here too, God is silent. Just like in chapter 28, God is nowhere to be found. Just like in chapter 28, David is in a lose-lose situation. Battle is upon him. He has to go. He has to make a decision. But here God providentially rescues David through the Philistines' own infighting. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, as the Philistines, they're, they're having this, this military parade uh, before going into battle. Uh, you, you can imagine some sort of, of, of parade where all the soldiers are marching through and, and everyone is, is getting, uh, building up courage through this, this, this sort of uh, pageantry. David and his men, they come through. The Philistine lords, they see David and his men, and, and that this just fills them with so much concern. And they say, what are these Hebrews doing here? And from that, this argument breaks out between Achish and between the other lords. And and Achish, he he tries to vouch for David, but it it says that the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. The commander of the Philistines said to him, send the man back that he may return to the place to which you assigned him. He shall not go down with us in battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. And it goes on and says, "Is is not this David of whom... They sing to one another in dances. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. All right, and then just like that, what seemed like a lose-lose situation, that pressure that was building, that David was going to have to make a choice, it just sort of vanishes and dissipates. And Achish comes to him in verse 10 with this good news. And he says, now then rise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who came with you. And start early in the morning and depart as soon as you have light. So David sent, set out with his men early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. Now where, whereas chapter 28, chapter 28 ends with this, this, this continual reminder of Saul having to leave by night. He goes to the medium by night, and he leaves in the darkness of night. Here in this final verse in chapter 29, it reminds us that David is leaving in the light of the day, of the new day. It says that three times in in the span of two verses, it's trying to make this point here, that in this scene, David is essentially being released from exile. He's essentially being released from his service in the, uh, with, with the Philistines. David, uh, from, from what we're able to, to tell, he, he doesn't have any, any uh, relationship with Achish uh, until after he's king. And so from here, he, he goes home, but his, his, his time in exile is drawing to an end, and his, his path to the throne is going to continue on. And chapter 29 is this beautiful picture of how God, however unseen, However hidden, however unbeknownst to David, God rescues his servant through providence. 
That's the simple and yet, and yet beautiful you catastrophe of this chapter, that David was in a lose-lose situation. And yet God providentially, through David's own enemies, through the Philistines themselves, God gives birth to this way of escape. What I want us to, to really see here is that God loves to work in lose-lose situations. This is how God works time and time again, where all hope seems lost, where there seems to be no clear way out of a situation beyond compromise or beyond death. You're either going to, to, to enter into a situation and you will be hurt with it, or you'll be hurt if you don't because you're going to have to compromise and your integrity will no doubt be broken. Your conscience would be weighted. What we see is that God always provides a way for his people. For our New Testament reading, we read uh, 1 Corinthians 10, and it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Listen to what that verse is saying, church. It's saying that the reason that you can be sure that when you are in a lose-lose situation, the reason that you can be sure that, that when you feel like there is no easy solution in any situation, the reason that you can be sure that you can, in fact, be faithful to your God, the reason that you can, in fact, be obedient to what your God has called you to, is because of what this verse says. It says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will always provide the way of escape. God has called you to be blameless. God has called you to obedience. And I recognize that that is a very difficult calling. That is a calling that, that will oftentimes feel absolutely impossible in this life. That will, uh, more often than not, create uh, situations where you will feel inclined to compromise. Obedience is difficult. Living this life in a blameless way is hard. But what the story is showing us, what that verse is showing us, is that God preserves the blamelessness of his people. God, what he requires of you, God will also provide for you. In temptation, in difficulty, in lose-lose situations, he will always provide a way of escape. If there's any doubt uh, about that, if, if, if this story uh, is, does not make that clear, I want you to think about then your, your own salvation. Uh, Tolkien, he, he called the gospel the greatest you catastrophe in human history. Because at the cross, evil destroyed itself, and at the resurrection, a new day dawned for you and I. At the cross, think about what happened. At the cross, Christ was in a lose-lose situation, and yet evil destroyed itself, and as evil destroyed itself, putting the Son of God to death, it gave birth to your salvation. And so let that be an encouragement to you that you can, in fact, endure. You can, in fact, walk before your Lord holy and blameless and obedient. We recognize not perfectly, but what God has called you to, what he has required of you, he will provide time and time again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ. Thank you that you always provide in every situation. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to grant us encouragement to be able to endure, to persevere, to know that you will be faithful. And may that knowledge of you being faithful to us help us to be faithful to you. Please continue to bless our worship this morning, Lord Jesus. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.